my story. And I want to testify to the awesome power of transformational prayer. I'm certainly not a guru. I'm a learner. I'm much like this little child, you know, I, I feel like that, that I have a lot more to experience, and I'm sure you feel that way too with regard to prayer. But I want to tell you what happened to me. A number of years ago, I was with a group of busy executives at World Vision, a Christian humanitarian organization, and we had a visiting speaker, and he arrested us with this question. He said, are you doing a program for the Lord or welcoming the presence of the Lord? Wow, did that stop us on our tracks. And one of those people was me. I was so busy doing my own stuff, carrying out my own agenda, and of course Scripture warns us about that, doesn't it? I was depending on my own strength. I was happy with what I was doing, but I got burnt out, and I went away for a two-day retreat at the suggestion of my boss, who could see that I probably needed it, and I began to have an encounter with the Lord, where he began to speak to my heart. Not an audible voice, but a megaphone in my heart. And he was saying to me, basically, he was saying, don't think you're impressing me with all the things you're doing for me. I'd been all over the world. I was, I was doing all kinds of ministry for him. And here he was saying, it really doesn't impress me that much. What really I'm after is intimacy with you. You're my child. That's what I value. And then he said, get out of my way. Let me be your senior partner and you will see my wonders. I was actually at a Benedictine monastery in the desert of California. Of course, my wife was afraid I would come back with one of those monks' hoods, you know. But they rented rooms to wayfaring pilgrims, you know. And I had those two days of encounter, and it shifted my whole ministry. Henry Nouwen, who wrote a little book called The Way of the Heart, said in that book, Solitude is the furnace of transformation. And that's what began to happen to me in those times of solitude that followed. And out of that, I began to get invited to take teams of prayer leaders into war zones, places that were just indescribably chaotic and horrible. And we would bring together Christian leaders all the way across the spectrum, and we would throw away our programs, we would throw away our agendas and simply seek to be present to the Lord and asking him to be present to us and pray for the healing and the transformation of those nations. And we saw such amazing wonders happen that we just couldn't believe it. And I want to tell you about some of those wonders. Cambodia was one of the first. The Khmer Rouge had killed two million of their own people in this utopian vision they had for a society that was controlled by them. And we took a team in there and began to pray with them. We asked intercessory prayer networks to pray that the Khmer Rouge would dissolve. That was the first request. Two months later, in the New York Times, it says the Khmer Rouge are dissolving. And then we began to see such amazing things happen in the country. Where there had been division, the National Christian Fellowship came together for the first time. And then there were signs and wonders that began to happen. And people began to come to the Lord all over the country. And the church grew from 10,000 to probably 400,000 is what they estimated in just a few years. And so this began to get my attention. And it was later that year that I was invited to take a team into Bosnia. In the middle of the war, we rented a car, we drove up through snipers to get to the Christians who were from the three ethnic groups that had been fighting. 250,000 had died in the conflict. Hundreds of thousands had been made homeless. 
And I remember us meeting behind all the sandbags piled up over the windows and go through a process of reconciliation. And one Serb woman stood up with the tears streaming down her face and she said, forgive us Serbs for what we have done to you Croats. And the Croats were so impacted, they stood up, three of them, and said, no, we're worse than you Serbs. And those from a Muslim background who'd come to the Lord also stood up, and then they ran to each other, threw their arms around one another, weeping, confessing corporate sin. And then we held hands around the room, and we agreed in the name of Jesus that peace would come to Bosnia. And within four days, the peace proposal was on the table, given by Milosevic, the hardened dictator. And Richard Holbrook, our arms negotiator, said, I don't know what softened him. Can you say praise the Lord? It was his doing, not ours. Afghanistan, we saw a similar thing happen, an amazing development, as we took a team in there under the Taliban, who were still in power, and I remember being in the stadium where they no longer did sports. They used it to cut off the limbs of petty criminals or to shoot women in the head who had made the mistake of talking with a man who was not their relative. We confessed the blood guilt before the Lord. We prayed, and there was never another execution or amputation in that stadium to the glory of the Lord. And then everything that was prayed for in that initiative was granted. There were thousands praying around the world, actually in all of these initiatives. And the Taliban were overthrown. Women's rights were restored. The children went back to school. Development began to come back to the nation. We need to keep praying now because the Taliban want to come back. Sierra Leone, we took a team in there in the middle of the war, a civil war that had gone on for about 10 years. And they were going around cutting off the arms and the legs even of small children, these rebels, like some evil force had gripped them. And uh, 1,200 leaders gathered in desperation and began to pray for three days. By the end of the first day, they had arrested the rebel leader. And then a peace process began over those months, and 50,000 rebels handed in their weapons to UN peacekeepers who broke them up and made them into farm implements. Praise the Lord. Now they have a born-again president who is fighting corruption and he's helping to lead the national prayer effort. Just in 2010, we were involved with a prayer initiative in Mexico with government officials. And we were praying about uh, the heroin trafficking and all of that. The next day, the headlines were that they had arrested the king of heroin and uh, as intercessors have prayed all around the world, the Mexican government has now gotten 25 of the 37 most wanted drug lords. Still a lot to do. But uh, President Calderon, uh, a secular president, became convinced that they were not going to win this war except through prayer. And he invited evangelical pastors, prayer leaders to pray, and I've been down there with, a, with uh, others to meet with him twice. A whole prayer movement has developed in Mexico in the streets, marching, praying, and God is answering. Praise the Lord. So we've learned some lessons that I'd just like to share with you, and are still learning them, really, that God can and will heal hearts and nations. We've all heard that famous verse in 2 Chronicles 7.14. He says that if we do four things, he will do three things. We have seen this work nation by nation. We have done these now in 55 nations. And so it's not just a serendipity. We've seen the wonders of God, his answering the prayers of his people. If we will come to him, if we will unite our prayer, Second lesson, prayer connects us to the awesome greatness of God. Now, this is not the number of our national debt yet. <laughs> this is the number of the stars that our God has created. 300 billion trillion. It's, the, it's about the 
number of the grains of sand on all the beaches of the entire earth. Our sun is one grain of sand. Just think of that. How awesome God is. And when we have a vision of how great he is, it ought to convert us into lifelong intercessors. Rather than knocking ourselves out and trying to strive to, to uh, make things work the way we want them to do, shouldn't we submit to him and say, we're, we're going to pray, we're going to ask you to fix these situations because they're hopeless, they're impossible. A Christian astrophysicist said, because prayer is extra-dimensional in its reach, it must be considered the most powerful capacity God has made available to us. Another said, prayer can do anything that God can do. Uh, we also exercise our God-given authority through prayer. You know, we were given authority over this planet, book of Genesis. We lost it, but we can regain it through prayer. We've been raised up, it says, to s sit with Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. We're already there. He's, we're sitting beside him, whether we know it or not. And so we can use that authority, that authority that he shares with us, to affect change on our planet through prayer. This is just a high privilege. It makes prayer such an influential thing. And two of my favorite quotes, history belongs to the intercessors who believe the future into being. And all over the world, the church is called to cast out demons, not only out of individuals, but also nations. God wants the church to rule, to bind principalities and powers with authority, and to determine the politics of nations. Just an example of this. Some friends of mine in, in Calcutta, India, were sick and tired of all the bribes they had to pay. They had to pay bribes for their birth certificates, for their marriage certificates, even for their death certificates. They were fed up. So they said, let's have an early morning prayer walk around the administrative center that's full of those corrupt officials. And so Jericho style, they walked around in the early morning praying. Within two weeks, the whole building collapsed in a pile of rubble. And the government brought in an honest man who fired all the corrupt officials. Next time I came back to Calcutta, they said, John, prayer works. Prayer works. How can we grow in transformational prayer? Just some practical things that I'm still learning. But uh, find a prayer partner. One of, the prayer, one of my prayer partners is seated over there, my wife. Another is a dear friend who has been my prayer partner for 24 years. And the three of us could fill an encyclopedia of all the answers as we've agreed in prayer. And I'm sure many of you could add uh, and write your own encyclopedia. Pray as a lifestyle. It should be natural as breathing. Not sort of a, something that we do as a religious duty, but something that's a delight. Just to be in the presence of God. Just to enjoy Him. Listen. Prayer is not a monologue. It's really two-way communication. And that's so very important to really listen and hear what he's saying and then do what he wants us to do. Be childlike. Pray simply and from the heart. We don't have to give God a lecture. A God like that knows everything. He just wants us to come in a simple, heartfelt way and be with him. Pray through the issues in the newspaper or broadcast news rather than complaining. God can change both hearts and headlines as we pray. And then I just wanted to conclude by saying that we're seeking to build a movement of transformational prayer here in New Mexico, and we would welcome your involvement. There are going to be upcoming prayer summits and also an email monthly where we can pray together all across the state for the issues of New Mexico. Thank you.